13th episode of the Messy Desk stream. Um, now that you can actually hear me, my mic is working. Uh, oh, yes, thank you, Megalana. She says it's better. Um, I'm very excited to have today Pablo and uh, Anna here. Um, they're going to tell you more about uh, what's going on. And thank you, Octavio, for telling me because I would not have noticed on my own that the mic wasn't working. Um, yeah, just quickly, please like, share, share the stream. Uh, send us any comments and questions you have during the stream. Um, anything that we talk about that you want us to expand on. Anything for Pablo in particular. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. So tell the audience a little bit about yourself before you play something. All right. Um, maybe you tell a little bit about yourself, right? Just because. What? Okay. Yeah, because no. I mean, I'm going to have a lot of time to talk about myself <laughs> like afterwards with Michael. So, uh, <laughs> hi, people. I am Pablo's girlfriend and I'm singing today for you guys. And I hope you enjoy it. I'm a very uh, good singer. I hope you like it also. I meant like, <laughs> like what we're going to play. Like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> just, uh, that's more kind of what I meant, but that's, that's also fine. It's also okay. No, we're playing today um, uh, Shivan and Gazan from Schubert, but a little bit different. It's of course with a guitar and it's originally um, a song for a voice and piano and also the text is kind of different. So I hope you enjoy a bit of Portuguese. Nice, Schubert. Okay, I'm gonna move my video out of the way here. Please do. And uh, you guys go ahead and show us some Schubert. Yep, can we go? It's very far away. Só me 
<laughs> yeah, those that was very hard to do. The notes were very far away. I'm sorry, I am probably leaning over Anna for that. But. Oh no, it's great. It sounds really nice. It's so nice to hear uh the guitar play that piece without having to struggle to play all the voices. <laughs> yeah. I, I almost feel honestly like the this version it, it's still close to not working on the guitar. Yeah. This is the Mertz arrangement, right? Oh, okay. That's how you get in American. Um, yeah, but I guess the solo version, it's also something, but I, I, I don't think I would play it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, cheers, Pablo. Hey, cheers. To your health. Um, that was really nice, yeah. You guys, um, she has a great voice, too, for, um, for this music and for playing this guitar, it sounds like. Sorry, I didn't understand. What is it? Uh, some, sorry, Philip is telling me that my mic is still very silent. Here, I'll turn it up a little bit. Um, if anyone, if my mic is still too quiet, let me know. Um, oh, I was just saying that her voice seems to fit really well with the guitar and well with this music also. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, this guitar is also new. The, the cedar guitar kind of sounds a bit more balanced. She likes it a bit more because, you know, her voice is high. So the cedar is a bit more like a bit darker and but we're trying yeah. it's fine octavio is saying beautiful if you guys can tell us more about the text also used so what's the text in this yeah actually we know this from the there's a version by um Artur Nestrovsky and Lieve Nestrovsky that has like an introduction from a different song actually from um Maria Bethany I think and um it's a really really nice uh version I mean it's on Spotify you can check it out uh it's called Serenata I don't remember, I remember the name of the CD, but there was this version, which was the first version that we, we heard, but also this Portuguese text was in a, like a soap opera, you know, like it's, um, it's a bit older. It's not so, um, it's not so new. Oh, wow. And yeah. So we just kind of like, we use this as a encore piece for the concert and stuff. So nice. I don't know. It's, I think it works. Wonderful. I yeah, see. it works great. Super. Um, so. I mean, clearly you play quite a bit of chamber music, as we can see, and we'll see more later. Uh, but can you tell us more about yourself, like where you, you know, don't give us the whole life story, but just kind of where you've studied, where you're from, what's your journey been with the guitar up till now, and how do you see, yeah. like, your artistic True. output now? Yeah. I mean, uh, I started when I was 11 playing electric guitar. I think it happens to a lot of people. Um, so I was playing, like, in rock bands and stuff when I was 12 and yeah. things like that. Um, and then I know, like, um, I don't want to complain too much, but I, like in the beginning, I didn't have much of a chance to like actually learn the guitar, you know, like my first teacher had the, you know, like with the fractions, it's not even tabs, you know, it's like, yeah. it has a number for the string and a number for the fret and you kind of have to learn through that and stuff. Right. So, I mean, it was fun anyway. Right. But it was very like dumbed down version of playing guitar. Yeah. I didn't have a traditional teaching and stuff. Um, but then when I was 17, I, I went to this um, music school in Rio called Villa Lobos uh, Music School, which is kind of traditional. I mean, it's a lot of people study there and it's in, in the, the downtown Rio. Um, so there I met a guy who had some contact with, uh, with uh, classical guitar and Brazilian guitar also, not just classical guitar, but, you know, so like uh, it was already from the beginning, like nylon string guitar for me was both um, like John Williams, Julian Breen, blah, blah, blah. And um, like the Brazilian Rafael Rabelo, Yamandu, and everybody. Yeah, you know. Yamandu, yeah, great, awesome. Oh, uh, Gabriela yeah. Imbesi says, "Are you happy that you know Leo Tsail? Because I'm not." Gabriela, I think we're with you on that one. <laughs> we'll talk about Leo later. Don't worry. Leo's gonna come up for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Uh, we'll talk about how that, that connection is there. Cool. So, so you studied in this conservatory in Rio, base, Rio, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So like I didn't finish, I studied there for like two years and then I started going to the to the music university. Actually, the first time I went to the engineering university because I don't have any musicians in my family at all. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the first like time that I went through the this whole, I don't know how you call it, but like SATs, uh, abitur process, you know, of like yeah. choosing a career. Um, I didn't have the guts to say I want to do music, right. you know, with my family and stuff. So it's I went to engineering. Um, it's, 
it's a it's a bit. I mean, my parents supported me, even though I like I can't expect them to really understand like the drive behind wanting to be a musician. Yeah. You know, it's very particular to to us, I guess, you know, like people who really want to express themselves artistically. It's really hard to understand, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um but they are like I remember actually there was one day that for me was like the 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 day that kind of I decided everything for myself was um I was in engineering school and after like one month I, I knew that I didn't want to be there right because uh, it was like f the whole day from six to I don't know to five like there you know taking up my whole day and then in the evening I would watch videos from Rafael Rabelo from Yamandu from like all the classical guitarists also and I would feel like man I, there's only so much time you know in life to do the stuff you want to do and I was feeling like yeah. you know of course, my family was like, no, first you go engineering and then when right, you graduate, yeah. you, you can start. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess it, it can go, it, people go different ways, right? But yeah, for me, course. I was really, I was really anxious. I was really like, I don't know what's going to happen. And then there was one day, of course, I was just going to school and just like playing cards with people and talking and sleeping in every class and blah, blah. blah. And then uh, there was one day that was like the last subject that I needed to do was some physics lab thing that I needed to do if I wanted to um, keep the possibility open of going back to engineering school. And in the same day, there was like a, a test in the, um, in the conservatory. I was playing, I was playing La Catedral, I don't know how, in the first year I was playing La Catedral. I, like, I wish I had the recording for that because it's just, uh, I don't know, it's probably very shitty. But for me, it was the day that I, I like, I actually called my dad on the phone. I was like, uh, I don't know. Um, I have to make a choice and I mean he was of course like I said I don't expect like he was he's always been very supportive even though I, I don't expect him to understand which I guess makes him even more supportive in a way right mm -hmm. um, but in the end he was like um, you just it's your life right and you have to make a decision so then I went that way and then uh, yeah and then studied in Rio my bachelor's and then afterwards came here to Hamburg for my master's cool um... basically Sorry, Tessa was saying she, she's having some difficulty hearing me, but I turned myself up on the actual audio interface. I'm sorry for all the audio problems, guys. I'm still getting used to actually doing all of this tech stuff. So hopefully that fixed it. Um, that's great. So yeah, so you had, um, I guess, a slightly non-conventional journey, but at the same time, you had a similar journey to a lot of guitarists in that you kind of got hooked on classical guitar after other types of guitar. I think that's very true for many of us. Not all of us, obviously, but... I mean, I started out in other genres, mostly like metal and stuff. Um, but I mean, I started playing as an adult too, so it's a bit different. But still, yeah, it's we, we sometimes end up getting sort of conned into classical guitar, you know, tricked into doing it by learning something and finding out how cool it is. Um, yeah. Nice, cool. So you're you're not done the master's yet? You're still doing the master's in Hamburg? Or? Actually, my graduation recital was two years ago, right? Oh, okay. So I mean, it was already kind of a long, it was three years mass, it's supposed to be two, but after the first year I changed professors. So I got like an extra semester and then I did another semester just so I could graduate and my whole family be here, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I did a three years master's and um, like I did all the fun part and I'm taking a very long time to do the not so fun part. Oh, the research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I just defended my research a week and a half ago and I passed thankfully, but... It took a lot out of my um, out of my month, let me tell you. So my exam repertoire was a bit rusty after that, you know. <laughs> uh, what did you play? Uh, what am I playing for the exam? Yeah. Oh yeah, in June I will play the Chacon, uh, the Grand Overture, and then two pieces that are not so played, which is uh, variations by Tillman Hopstock on the theme by Debussy, and a big a big sonata my friend Nathan Bredesen wrote me, which is an homage to Shostakovich. So it's like a twenty minute guitar sonata um new piece yeah Very so cool. it's a it's a big beefy program not actually a great concert program i think because the the music is so like heavy you know but good yeah. for my development so yeah yeah i was thinking about that actually today i mean the um, as i was going back in the old videos like and and thinking about all the crazy shit that you do like you know like i'm gonna play this concerto in a month i'm gonna learn it or in two months or i'm gonna play this big sonata i mean the I think this is the moment to do it, right? When yeah. The university you're kind of protected by everything. You have the stage, you have the people yeah. who go there and criticize you. So you just have to do And that. the audience that comes to this, like my colleagues and my professors, are going to enjoy that kind of program. 
Whereas I would never, well, not never, but I would very rarely program that in a concert for, let's say, normal humans, right? So, um, so in a way, it's kind of the time too, because it, you can do a crazy uh, concept like that in your as an artistic choice, and it can land on the audience well. Whereas in in real life, it it's not going to be so often possible, you know. So. Um, Cool. So, okay, so you fin you're you finishing up the masters, but you play a lot of chamber music too, so you have a lot of projects. Maybe we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but um, I'm going to ask you my gotcha question. So this is the question uh -huh. that's supposed to be hard to answer. Uh, how do you define classical guitar? Shitty question, man. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I, mean, I heard it a couple of times already, right? Because right. I keep watching the stream and, yeah. and trying to uh, figure out. I mean, honestly, I have no idea. But I did... Um, as I, last week you were talking to Evan mm -hmm. and something crossed my mind where I, I don't know maybe you can say if it's true or not but I think like the more a person um, or a player identifies himself as a classical guitarist like the broader they try to make the concept and I think the other way around like I have an example in mind actually I'm not going to mention the person but um, there's a Brazilian guy who um, does a lot of uh, talking about classical guitar and blah 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 but I feel, this is my feeling, that he doesn't really see himself as a classical guitarist. I mean, in Brazil, like guitar is classical, but there's always, there's also like a big part of it. It's like a different culture of playing. So people are not really learning necessarily by the notes. People learn how to improvise. There's the seven string guitar, choro, which people really value, which is awesome, right? I mean, it's a, it's a different thing. It's kind of, kind of like a jazz language, so to speak, right? Right, yeah. So, I mean, of course, the way we learn things and the way we... It, it can be limited, right? I mean, uh, we, we dedicate ourselves to technique and to learning repertoire, but I mean, there is a, there's room for like not um, analyzing things deeply or maybe not learning how to improvise. I mean, of course, it doesn't mean that everybody does it, but what I, what I was like gonna maybe ask you, I don't know, I didn't watch everybody, but I think that a part of it is like, if you see yourself as a classical guitarist, you kind of try to broaden everything. Like, no, it's not just the repertoire because, yeah, Dion's is not so much classical guitar or I don't know, you know, like Barrios is not classical because it's not in the classical period or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, yeah. I don't know. For me, it, it's, it's kind of like I don't really understand what it means to be a classical guitarist. Honestly, I don't say it. I just say like I play guitar. Yeah. That part, that part I know is true. But I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've changed more often to calling myself just a guitarist. I think this is a trend for a lot of younger players, let's say. Um, then again, if I need to define it, it is sometimes helpful to say I'm a classical guitarist in the sense that I play classical music on the guitar. But I usually don't try to, yeah, I don't know, define exactly what that is. I think, yeah, it's just problematic because it doesn't really work in terms of style. I think that the arguments from like, techniques of playing and techniques of writing for the type of music we play is more convincing because you can say actual measurable things about that of course those categories still break down at the margins but yeah what do you mean like i mean you can say like oh it's contrapuntal music for example like you can explain describe the techniques of writing that go into the type of music we play and that's you know often accurate not always accurate to what it means to be classical music but at the same time yeah, it doesn't really work. And then you can also define it by the physical aspects of the instrument, like nylon strings, the fact that we play with the fingers, with nails, etc. But even those things aren't always true. So it's just, yeah, not possible, I guess. Maybe I need to find a new question that's answerable. Oh, that's a nice question. <laughs> just to think about it, it's nice, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it, but you're right. At some point, it just becomes whether you define yourself as that or not. So, yeah. Okay, uh, well, since we don't have an answer to the question, <laughs> let's move on to we're just we're just going right through this. this is great let's move on to our favorite game the repertory listening test Fuck. okay uh <laughs> yes it's time for you to be embarrassed pablo uh, <laughs> oh ioana says hi mike your microphone is better now thank you uh still softer than pablo's but okay okay i'm gonna try keep ad ad adjusting it so if i'm still too soft please tell me um and everyone can look forward to i'm gonna have ioana on uh, next month ioana uh, guns are so that'll be fun. Um, okay, so the repertoire listening game. So you know the drill. There's three levels. You can get. You will listen to the track, and then you will attempt to guess the composer, the piece, or the player, and or all three. And um, so there's three points per piece, three pieces per category, 27 points in total. 
and you have a call in, so you can ask the audience for help at one point. Oh, now Michael is loud enough, but Pablo is silent. Okay, let me turn. Yeah, I just on. I just read that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is this better? Um, or Do you have a control over that? Like, yeah, your, I, your I can control it right here. I think that your um. I, no, I don't think it's your problem. I have a control here. Just just leave it as is because I'm trying to adjust it based on what people say. Okay. Uh, if it still sounds out of balance, please tell us. Okay, number one, first piece in the beginner category. You ready? Yeah. I believe I've shared audio with you, so you should hear this. Uh, uh, oh, fuck shit. I'm supposed to know that. I have a friend who plays it all the time. Um, is it Hagondi Etude? No, not Ragondi Etude. Okay, I'm, you know what's really weird is I'm not hearing the audio now, which is very strange, but I don't actually have to hear it. So can the audience tell me if you can uh, hear it, hear the music? Because as long as you guys and Pablo can hear it, it's fine. Uh, do you want to hear a bit more of it, Pablo? Um, I'll go further in the no, piece. No, I don't think I'm going to do I mean, uh, if I haven't learned it to the day, I don't think I'm going to find that out. Um, I can give you a hint. You get one hint per piece. Very nice. Um, this is a piece for, uh, well, two guitars actually, um, and it's from the 20th century. No way. Oh, Octavio says he can't hear. Oh no. Okay. Wait, everybody. Let me see if I can fix my settings. Uh, Tessa also says she can't hear it. Okay, everybody, I have a problem. Let's see if stopping the audio share helps. Let me see if this fixes it. No, I still can't hear it. Okay, let me go to let me go to my audio settings. Um, Pablo, you can entertain our guests while I. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm hearing the comments on uh, YouTube just um basically trying to find out what's going on no feeling sorry about myself that i missed the very first piece on the very first level <laughs> already um <laughs> yeah. wait audio um other sound settings playback use this to uh, tedesco this is a tedesco piece i think um yes you are correct Oh, fuck. Okay. Um, why are the speakers uh, yeah. not working? Here, let me see if I unplug my headphones. That solves it. Check, check. If I play this now, will it work? This has never happened before. There's always something new with OBS and with streaming software, you know? Ugh, it's still not working. There's always something... Two apps are using your microphone. Yeah, that's fine. But how come I can't hear anything? Ah, I solved it. I solved it, everybody. Okay, everyone yeah. can hear now. I'm going to play the piece so that they can hear it. Right. Do, you, do you still hear Pablo or no? Yeah, yeah. I hear in the background, but yeah. Uh, let me make sure that I'm sharing audio with you again. Sorry, everybody. We're getting there. We're getting there bit by bit. Okay, I think now I everyone should be able to hear now. <laughs> Emma says, I didn't hear it, but it's uh, Rodrigo Tonadia. That's a good guess for a duo piece, but it's not that. I actually thought no, about... No, it's, it's a Tedesco Prelude, uh, I think, like E major or... A e major, B you got major. it. Tedesco E major. E major? Okay. Yeah, who's the prelude? Uh, who's the player? I can't give you a hint for the player. Uh, duo, uh, Brazil guitar duo. Nope. It's the then. Frankfurt guitar duo. No fucking way. Yeah. <laughs> it's your teacher. It's because, you know, the audio, it's the audio is really killing you. <laughs> you didn't recognize your own teachers playing. <laughs> oh man. Okay, can you tell us about this duo say. though? Can you tell us about this duo? I can tell you a little bit about this duo, not too much. I mean I, I listened to the recordings, but it was on vinyl actually. I have mm. a friend here in Hamburg who has the recording on vinyl, but I heard them uh, not very often. You, you really can't find, like, they're, of course, not on Spotify, 
Um, you can find them uh, on YouTube. I, I tried once, but I couldn't find them. So the only two times I heard them was um, um, either a CD from a friend or a vinyl. Yeah, I got um, these from Leo. <laughs> A motherfucker. Yeah, I was like, Leo, what should I put on the, the guessing game? And he's like, well, his teacher has this duo recording, blah, 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 uh, his former teacher. Uh, and I thought, well, I thought, yeah, well, that, it's, that's it's Tedesco. You got the Tedesco part, so that's easy. And I thought, it's your teacher. For sure, he'll know. Nope. Okay. So you got two out of three yeah, on that. Not too bad, because you got the piece and the composer. Okay. And you knew which prelude, nice. e, e major. So that's that's pretty good. Can I get one and a half for that? Because it's out of twenty four possibilities, right? Uh, no, it's just a little. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not how it works. Not okay. how it works. Yeah. I give out extra points when I feel like giving out extra points, Pablo. Oh, there you go. No pushing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. I'm glad that I finally solved all of my audio problems. <laughs> okay. This one. Any idea? Yeah, it's a very old recording. Um, Do you want to hear some more? I, I, I've heard this piece, but I don't... That, uh, that's a Segovia recording. Yes, it's Segovia. I thought you might be giving the player just from the sound. It's Segovia, and who's the composer? Spanish composer. I want to say Ponce. No, oh, Spanish. Okay. Spanish. Uh, Toroba? Yes, Federico Moreno Toroba. Um, do you know which piece it is? I'm going to just honestly guess. I think it's one of the piezas características. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which set it's from, actually. I only know the title. <clears throat> yeah, but I don't know the name. I'm going to go with uh, Arada. It's a uh, Roman de los Pinos. There we go. Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't know the name. But yeah, still, you got Toroba and you got Segovia right from the sound. So that's great. That's like, that's yeah. quality guessing there. Okay, next one. Last one in the beginner category. Just wait till the final category. This is the beginner category. Yeah. All right. Any idea? Yeah. Do you want to hear uh, more? Dalland. Yeah, Dalland. Uh, you don't have to name the exact number. You can just name what type of piece it is. Fantasia. It's a... Not a Fantasia. Oh, it's a Fantasia. Sorry, I, I missed that. Yes, Fantasia. Okay. Darlin Fantasia and who's playing? I can give you a hint for the player. Uh, this is an American player. Any idea? American players are really gonna get me, man. Um, I'll throw you a bone, a GFA winner. Jason? No, Javier Jara. Uh, he's American, okay. Yeah, yeah, he's American, but he studied in France, at least as far as I know. Okay. Um, okay, so so two out of three. So every category, you got, or every piece you got two out of three. That's not bad, so six out of nine. It's really not bad. Okay. At all. You're doing good so far. Keep 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 we'll positive. See now. Yeah. All okay, right. next one. Uh, da -da 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 -dun 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 -dun. Here we go. Okay, yeah, that's Bach. Um Yes. The Fugue. Fugue from That's the one we play in A minor, right? Yeah, people do play this in A minor, but... Yeah. That's the number, right? That's what you want, right? Yes, the number would be good. Thousand? Nope. Can you guess? Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you a hint. Okay, this is not. It's it's the same melody. Same the, the same theme. Uh, thousand one. No, actually. <laughs> what man? This is real. It's also a player. A uh, player that you should probably know. One of the players. Is oh, one no. that you should probably know. 
I should not make faces as the music's playing. Okay. Do you want to hear some more? There's two players. I'll give you that. It's, it's actually a duo. It's, a, it's arranged for two guitars, but it's also originally for more than one instrument. And both the players are German, as far as I know. And one of them is one that you should really know. <laughs> actually, both of them, That's probably. Both of them? Yeah. Is that the... Well, I'm not going to say it's a Frankfurt to do it because you already played me some from them. Right? No, so it's not them. But it may have some overlap. <laughs> some overlap. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, uh, no, okay. If, I, if one of them I should know, I imagine, is from my other professor, right? The, um, um, it's... One of the players is Olaf van Gonesen. Oh, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna know. It's Tillman Hopstock and Olaf van Gonesen. All right. Ah, Octavio had it. Tillman Hopstock from that box city. Yes. And the piece is actually. I'll give you half a point because you know the theme, but it's mm -hmm. actually BWV. Um, what is it? BWV five three nine, and it's originally for I think organ and two violins or something. It's another version of that fugue that Bach okay, rewrote. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know there was a third version. I only found this because I was looking up your professor's name on Spotify um, mm -hmm. because I was trying to find recordings of him for the re listening test. And this came up and I was like, didn't even know this was a thing. So, okay. That's tricky, tricky. But, All right. but that's one and a half points because you knew Bach and you knew the, the theme. So, All right. Okay. I'm sorry. That was a bit mean, I know, for intermediate level. No, that's fine. If you want me to lose, it's okay. It's also no problem. <laughs> You're already like just like so cynical about it. You're just like, <laughs> it's over. It's all over. Okay. Um, this all right, one. let's go. I'll play the beginning. I'm not gonna this one. You really don't know this? This one was mean, Mike. I know, Flavio. I know. I don't know, man. Rodrigo something? No, it's um, it's it's Vicente Asensio. Oh, it's... Uh, okay. So what's the piece? It's from the... Should I know the exact name of the, the movement? No, you can just name the piece. The collect whatever in team yes collective <laughs> team yes precis precisely <laughs> and the player is from a um Tarega competition winner spanish player i believe spanish i think so i'm pretty sure this guy is spanish not cuban no jose antonio escobar no, is he spanish oh god okay i'll give you half a point for that because i'm just mean anna says it's the wine haha <laughs> exactly Okay, I'll give you one and a half points because I was mean also and said the wrong nationality. <laughs> All right, very nice. Um, okay, last one in intermediate category. This one should probably be easy for you, I think. I hate when you say that. idea no no i know the piece uh, it's villa lobos um uh, gavotten gavot i think from the no you get another mm -hmm. guess um, it is one of the choros but which one yeah um wait uh, no, now the name is me. there are two I think from honest, this is my favorite one, but I don't remember the fuck. Shit. How do you call it? Uh, wait, wait, I played. This I'm going to remember. Okay. I'm going to remember. No, don't play it again. I know which one it is. Um, uh, it's so nice to watch. Uh, Scottish. 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 Yeah. Scottish. Scottish. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No. Very nice. And who's the player? I don't think it's an own from the from the Mato thing. French player. Ah, oh, man. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. So unhelpful. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, je dis qu'à Yeah, je dis qu'à You got it. Yeah. Okay. He plays these a lot. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he so does. three out of three on that one. Okay, so in the intermediate category, you also got six out of nine. Choose. Yes, very good. I mean, I was I was kind. I was benevolent this time. You don't have to shoot him. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay, <laughs> next one. Advanced category. You ready to go? You ready to go? Okay. Okay, that's uh, at also French player. Yes. Uh, Thomas Villotto, Assad from the Switch Brasileira, number four. Number three, but I'll give it to you. Number three. I played this Coco? piece. The, yeah, Coco. Yeah, this piece is fucking nuts. When I played this, I like almost like lost my mind. Seriously. Really? Yeah, that. I want to play that. It seems easy, but that last movement in F major is just a nightmare. It's so fast, and it's like, yeah, it's very, um, yeah, and it's it's you can play actually all the notes without too much trouble, but it's getting the right articulations is like a nightmare for the right hand and the left hand. It's just crazy. Okay, well, that was easy for you apparently. So, apparently, I don't know how to gauge what's advanced and what's easy. Um, this one. You still have your calling, by the way. You can ask for help. Any idea? No. Do you oh, want help nice. from the audience? Um, from the audience, yes. Okay, so everybody, um, Pablo's using his call for help. Please help him identify this piece. Just ask uh, Flavio. Flavio, help. I'll go a little bit further. There's a bit of a delay with the chat, so we'll just wait and see if anyone's yeah. anything. Anybody? I don't think anyone's helping you, man. Yeah. I can give you a hint. Um, Flavio says, fuck, <laughs> I know this. That's not very helpful, Flavio. If you know it, you have to say. Can't remember. It's um, Here, I'll give, I'll give everybody a freebie to help Pablo. It's a piece by Tanzman. Oh, no. And that should help with picking the player, too, because there's a player who recently recorded a whole bunch of Tansman. Uh, it's uh, Andrea De Vitis. Yes, Andrea De Vitis playing Tansman, and the piece is... It can't be from the... Like, it can't be from the from the suite. No. It's not... Uh, the Sakalia is not, of course... And those are not team, advanced. But... Those, are, those are intermediate or beginner at best. Yeah, but I, I don't think I would know the... It's a standalone piece. piece. It's a standalone piece. No, no it's not oh. in the collection. Mm, uh, says Flavio. On, Hondo. It's Hondo. No. Ah, Flavio got it. Homage to Chopin. No, sorry. Uh, wait, I think it is. Wait, let me double check. Yes, Homage to Chopin. Ballade, Homage to Chopin. Very nice, Flavio. You helped. So, three out of three on that. I. Uh, yeah, okay. That's fine. You yes. used your call in. That's fair. Okay, next one. Last one. idea no no not at all <laughs> no i don't think i ever i, I don't think i ever heard that no i'm laughing at flavio flavio says you're welcome pablo i had you guys on speaker while showering and i had to jump out lol <laughs> so flavio got out of the shower to tell you the the, <laughs> the answer please be safe be safe flavio and he, says, way back. <laughs> he says so you owe me a beer next time you come to maastricht pablo <laughs> 
I'll do, man. I'll do it. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's real friendship. I mean, getting out of the shower to answer the question for you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, so you don't know this piece. Okay, it's Platero Io by, Tedes uh, by Sense de la Masa, played by Anton Bernhoff. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't know it. Like, I never heard it. Okay, yeah. yeah. There's, There's a really nice CD of Sense de la Masa by, by my former professor, Daniel Bolshoi, actually. All right. Yeah, there's all these really I'll nice pieces out. by him that nobody plays. Okay, so Pablo, in the end, you got six out of nine in every single category. So is that bad? Is that good? I don't know. That's something, right? That's something. And actually, you, your total score is 18 out of 27, which I have to say is one of the higher scores I've seen. So there you go. The only shameful thing is that you didn't recognize your teacher either time. <laughs> I know, but I, I blame that on him. Like he never gave me CDs. He yeah. never gave me anything, right? And it's yeah. impossible to find yeah. him. So the only time I heard him, it was on a drunk night with a friend that he played the LP. So right. he, there was no way I could ever. Right, yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound like he promotes his playing that much, at least online, right? So. No, I mean, he plays a lot. Yeah. He's, he's also a, cha a chamber musician also. Like, um, to be honest, I like, I started studying it with him and he's like a big role model for me in the way he thinks about music and he um it's it's very stress-free in a way and it's very much about playing with people it's not it, it's not that it's you don't have to prepare yourself is that you have to of course be on your best um but it's also about being generous on stage and playing with other people and listening and uh you know being part of the the whole thing not just like i'm i'm mr solo owner, guitar yeah yeah solo big ego yeah you know um yeah and I, I don't know if like i don't know the order of the videos blah, blah blah that we did but actually i recorded with leo uh one piece that um he like we found out about this piece because of him oh, okay. and he actually recorded it also i think a long time ago cool you can also cool. you can also find a recording of it by i think berlina duo um on youtube but uh, we played this piece a lot. That was one of the first pieces we played. We played Saw Fantasia, and then we played this piece. Yeah, so, okay, so just quickly before we listen to this, because it is the next video, actually, I've queued up. Um, the reason that you and I know each other is because of Leo Tsail, who is yeah. a great uh, guitarist who's also studying where I'm studying in Maastricht with Carlo Marchione. And um, I kind of met Leo, and, you know, he was like, well, I have this duo. And so I saw this video, actually, it's one of the first things I saw from him, his playing, and I really, really loved it. Um, and then I kind of knew you peripherally because I sort of saw you on Instagram and stuff also, um, because we're both, you know, trawling through Instagram. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so then, yeah, so then we met cause you came to Maastricht to visit. So it's really cool connection, but Leo's a great player and you guys have had a duo for how long now? Uh, we had a duo for, um, more than two years for sure. I think around two and a half years or three years. Cool. Uh, we started, should I say how we started? No. Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, the thing was, uh, I was in this orchestra project, actually, playing mandolin, and there was a guitarist part of it, right? And she said, I played this uh, piece by Saw, and we were, like, staying in, like, the whole week in uh, a city close to Hamburg, and there was going to be this festival. Actually, the guys from uh, Open Strings Berlin were there. There were no uh, Open Strings Berlin at the time, but they told me about the project and everything. And they were going to do like a filming of the festival in the end in Berlin. There was a thing. And she was like, and, and I asked her, should we play something? Like I had my guitar, of course, right? Because I'm not a mandolin player. I was just there for the, for the gig, right? Never touched a mandolin in my life. And then it was like, yeah, can you play it? Yes, of course. Of course you can play it. And then, yeah, whatever, right? And then we played the Soa Fantasia. And when I got back to Hamburg, Leo was... Of course, when Leo was here, he was very much like organizing all of the things and, and uh, the class and the, we had yeah, class yeah. concerts every month. And he was like, Pablo, do you have anything to play? Nobody else wants to play. I'm like, no, but I actually just played a, a duo piece. Do you want to play? So we played this first Soa Fantasia, um, number 54, which is the one that um, uh, Julian Breen and John Williams played together. Also, there's a video on YouTube. I don't know if you know this one. It's a very fun. Yeah, yeah. Piece. It's great. So we played that. And then from there, it was fun. And then we just started like playing other yeah. stuff and other pieces and everything. Yeah, Leo's very organized. Um, yeah, he's an inspiration to us all. Um, Tessa Van Der Veen says, hashtag influencers. You know it, Tessa. <laughs> We're just here for the likes, you know? We're not all about music. We're just here for the... No, I'm just kidding. 
Okay, um, so we're going to listen to this recording you guys made. And Leo told me you made it in, the, in his parents' house. It's quite a nice yeah, location. Actually, that's, that's his living room in Hamburg. Cool, nice. Well, uh, recording all the way from Hamburg for everybody. Okay, let's listen to some of this uh, duo. All right, yeah, just one last thing. Like in the yeah. video, you're going to see the name of the, the duo is wrong because, of course, we didn't have a name at the time, right? So uh, it was okay. duo. We did the last name thing. But now we have a duo called Duo, duo Zello. So yeah, Zello. and the piece is a, a, a prelude and fugue by a French composer from the 20th century. It's not so modern-y, but it is a pretty cool piece. The prelude is more like impressionistic style. I really like it. Some... Yeah. I really like it too. That's yeah. Really cool. That's cool. Um, and it's on That's YouTube cool. if people want to listen to it again. Um, and sorry, yeah. I'm just going to tell you, Pablo, I forgot to mention before, just don't either mute your microphone or don't say anything while it's playing because your audio will still come I'm going to mute it. Yeah, just, just mute it. it. Okay, I'm going to put this recording on now.
nice. Okay. Pablo. Pablo. Hey. <laughs> How's it going? Oh, I can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Are we supposed to be back? I yes. thought we were still in the beat. Oh, was it? I saw it cut and I thought that it was over and it had restarted. No. Okay. I can actually open it. In... You're, fucking, you're fucking up my fugue, man. <laughs> I can open it in VLC. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, here. I can open it in VLC and skip to that part. Do you know how many minutes in it is in it as approximately? I found the spot. Here we go. Okay, I found where it is. Add window capture. Sorry, everybody. No, nope, not Premiere Pro. There we go. All right. Yeah, that's a cool piece, right? So cool. Um, yeah, sorry about screwing that up, everybody. I'm used to there being one piece and then it cutting, and I didn't prepare properly. 
Well, uh, some of the other ones. Actually, I think every video is at least more than one piece. Okay, sure. you just the next video, just warn me. <laughs> yeah sure. um cool that's great very nice um yeah the people are really loving the piece i think it's really nice to play something like this that's uh you know not often heard especially guitar duos we play a lot of the same rep so yeah awesome sure. um rick phillips says the recording is amazing guillermo says pablo i love you so much um oh hi everybody who's watching just please if you could share the stream we would really appreciate that it would be awesome just yeah, gonna do my cool. annoying plug um, and just so everybody knows, I did finally get a Patreon up and running too. So if anyone feels like supporting the stream, that's a way. And or you can donate during the show one time, and that goes also to the artist. So if you want to support Pablo, this is a good way to do it too. Uh, anyways, now that uh, I've done my annoying self plug, um, so yeah, you have a lot of like chamber music projects. Actually, it's not just Leo, right? You also have no. Uh, so actually, the first one was with the flute was Ingrid. Um, when when I got here, um, first end of the first semester, of course, she was looking for somebody to play piazzola because everybody is right. Nice. And I actually uh, always said, like before coming here, that I hated piazzola. I don't like his music. Everything sounds the same. Blah blah. blah. And I can say honestly that after three years, that's by far the composer that I play <laughs> most often. Yeah. I mean, I play <laughs> I play that a million times with everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean the. I mean, that piece you can play with basically everybody, right? With violin, yes, cello, yeah. and viola, clarinet, flute. I, I, don't, I mean, honestly, it's like, I, I even thought like at some point somebody's going to put lyrics and just play with the singer because it's like, it's, yeah. it's this close, right? It's yeah. this close. So, uh, of course, she was looking for somebody, so we started playing, and I just realized how much fun it was and how, like, actually how much you learn by playing with people who are not guitarists, yeah. who don't experience the same... Um, technical problems that we do right they don't they don't care right i mean they just want to play and then um whatever we have to do to like reach our musical goals it's our problem you know technique technique yeah. wise but then it was also pretty cool that um i mean with her it worked pretty uh really nice with the energy and um like the way to rehearse and she was very care carefree also but amazing musician and with very fast reaction so you can always suggest something she was she i think she's listening to this so i'm not going to kind of compliment her too much because it's <laughs> it's always dangerous you know but it was nice you know it was very nice and then came anna and leo kind of at the same time with anna we started playing one year after with the flute but not very seriously we did like a little a project here that we we're playing for um it's called lmn live music now so the concerts are not so um like you don't have to play like program pieces you can play like lighter stuff that's what we did mm -hmm. and then uh with leo like like i said you know and then it's honestly at some point it's enough because it's like this, there are only so many projects that you can plan yeah for yeah and and plan the concerts and plan the videos it's and so it. much i mean i have I have my thing with Jessica, my fiance, who's also a singer, and we have a duo. We play like right now we play all Spanish music, but you know, we played for a few years different things. And then mm -hmm. I have also a project with another guitarist also. We have a lot in common, Pablo. Um, <laughs> but he's a guitarist in Canada. So that's kind of a more a project where we usually do like a string of concerts or something once a year or some kind of project together once a year where we come together and play some special program. Like last year we did this tour in Ontario that was all new Canadian music. But even just one tour like that with one project is already a lot of work in one year. Plus your other dedicated ensemble that you're seeing every week, it becomes a lot to yeah. rehearse and everything. And No, for sure. I mean, for me, it feels like there's like a one year period where you're just like trying new pieces and yeah. finding your program and everything. And then after that, it kind of gets easier because you have whatever, like if you find a concert, you have your program and then you can plan like one new piece and then just yeah. like slowly do that thing, you know? Yeah. But before that, it's really hard. I mean, well, if, and when you start, you have sorry. to also make, you have to make a website or, or at least some kind of social media. Yeah. You have to have a bio written, you have to get photos. So it's a lot of stuff up front and make nice recordings so that you can look for concerts. So there's a lot of work in the first, yeah, the first period indeed, where it's like, you know, new project. Um, Ingrid says, I do care. And she says, tell me more. So you're going to get in trouble, Pablo. No, it was nice. It was actually nice with Ingrid because we, we played together and then she moved. Uh, After yeah. the first year, she, she moved for her master's to Vienna. 
And uh, well, it's a story about the other recording that I put, but I think we're gonna play it in the end, so it's fine. Yeah. Just remember to just remind me to tell the story at the end. Right? Okay, I will. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're gonna listen to we're gonna listen to you guys at the very end. Uh, so yeah. everyone, stick around for that. You know, <laughs> you better not leave. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, if they can sit through all my technical issues. Um, yeah. Nice. And how do you, so you, you must be rehearsing a lot because you do so much chamber music, but also how do you practice on your own? Because you still have to practice solo stuff and technique and everything, right? So what are yeah. your, what are your I thoughts mean, about practice? About practice? Yeah. I mean, actually from the last year, I've been doing a lot more of the technical stuff for sure, like half an hour every day. Um, and I feel like that really sets me up to success in the, yeah. in the whatever comes yeah. round so to speak, right? I mean, I have, um, depends, man, because I mean, depends what your goals are, right? I mean, for me, I'm fully committed to having some solo pieces, but um, it's not like I'm committed to playing um, competition stuff, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not like I have to really grind those pieces, you know, like the last time I played any competition piece was two years ago in my Absolus, you know, it was like in my final recital, you know? So it's not like, it's not like I need to repeat a lot for the stuff that I'm playing. And, that, and that's, that's actually what I wanted to do because I started last year doing some more like Instagram stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just found how cool it is that you can like practice something, play, and then people listen to it, right? And you yeah. don't have to put so much stress on it. So actually this year I started doing some like, my goal was when this whole quarantine thing started to have one video every week of a new piece. Yeah, that was my goal. So of course, by that, I'm not saying a new piece like, you know, Jose Sonata. It's yeah, not yeah. Hinastera. Next week, Hinastera, guys. It's not going to be like that, you know? <laughs> Next week, the video sequenza, you know? It's fine. But, but, I mean, the, the cool thing is like, I mean, I know if I'm being completely honest, like I have some strengths, which is like I learn really fast and I learn like by memory really fast. Um, but I have a lot of deficiencies where it's like I get really bored with the piece. And I don't really like take her, I don't practice a piece for like six months, right? So if I need to play like a bigger piece for me, sometimes it gets a bit boring. Like I have to play it over and over again. I play for like three months and then I stop playing it and then I play it again, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I think Instagram and, and YouTube and stuff work really, actually uh, like a friend of mine from Rio told me that I should start doing like YouTube videos because I was just doing Instagram and it's of course like up to in it. And she's like, why don't you just do a full piece? And I was like, yeah, that's nice because there's so so much music that it's like nice music and they can really uh, present to people something different, you know? Um, of course, if you're gonna play, uh, I don't know, like Choro da Saudade or something, there's like a million things to compare to, but there are a lot of pieces that are worth being played that nobody does and you can just really prepare them in a smaller, like smaller amount of time. For sure, and, and attention spans are not what they necessarily used to be. Well, even then, I mean, it's just, it's it's not and i don't mean that in a negative way but just in a way of like you can't really i mean you can you, know, you, you can obviously put out recordings of really long pieces but if you want an audience that's going to listen consistently to what you do it's, it's sometimes better that it's shorter i don't know um but yeah i i think the recording for an online audience is like there's upsides and downsides to it but the great thing about it is that you get your playing heard and you get to have an impact, you know, right away um, on people. Uh, and I mean, that's valuable. Like, otherwise you're kind of sitting in your room practicing, practicing, practicing until the next concert or the next competition, which may be a thing, but it's kind of like, at what point are you sharing the music? You know, I don't know. I, I think it's a moment. I mean, honestly, there's a moment where you kind of, it's worth doing it, right? I mean, if you never prepare a big piece, if you never prepare a sonata and you just play small pieces, you know what I mean? Like there's a yeah. there's a learning curve there and there's something to learn that you're never going to learn if you don't do it, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's why I think the university is there for that. But when it comes to like presenting pieces to new people and stuff, it's nice if you can um, prepare like more varied stuff. And it's also, honestly, it's just nice for me because like I'm the guy, like here in Hamburg, they had a, a music store and actually closed last year or this year, I don't remember. But I would just go there and just like read, read a bit through the pieces and stuff and like, have a lot of pieces in my room for of like pieces that there are no recordings for i don't find them at least right maybe there are yeah but i don't know um and then i just enjoyed like being home if i could do this like full time just be home 
like put my pieces, record them somehow, maybe teach some lessons and stuff. I mean, for me, it's I'm completely fine with that. You know, I have no ambitions of, I don't know, playing competition and stuff. So yeah, I mean, I actually enjoy doing it. The other well, the other point to make is that maybe if you do do competitions, you just pick ones where you feel like you can get away with a program with a bit more of this, you know, um, or you or you you play in a way where it shows your individual artistic choices in the program, you know. That's the problem with competitions, is though, is you, yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't think it's so much of a problem. I mean, competitions have a reason to be right. No, I don't mean that they're a problem in general. I just mean that like picking a program that's really specific to you as an artist and what works for you and what you like to do doesn't always work with the jury, but that's okay, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something you you said a week ago or two weeks ago that I thought was like I really agreed with was that you said that um for you the competitions that were like more worthy of playing were the ones that there was a uh, like audience or audience prize or something like that right? yeah well more um, than they're public open to the audience to listen to because the judges listening to you can be useful if they give you some useful feedback but sometimes they don't give you any useful feedback even if when you ask yeah. for it but then when you have an audience listening to you at least you get a platform to play for people you know yeah, yeah, exactly. But th- I agree completely. I mean, now that's that's what happened, right? When the quarantine hit, I was doing the one a week thing piece and I did it four. But one of them I put in a competition and I went to the next round. So now I have to I had to stop doing what I wanted to do. I actually was planning on like playing some etudes and presenting the etudes with like challenging myself to learn them in a week and also like what lessons you get from learning a piece like that and preparing to record and I wanted to present these pieces you know like especially there were a lot of uh composers that I knew because I think we were always like in a little bubble thing right I mean I saw you interview a lot of people from from America for instance right Mm -hmm. and there's the American bubble thing and then there's the European bubble thing and there's the Brazilian bubble thing right and even Brazil the fact the real the real um composers and players and what they listen to and what they play and then in Sao Paulo there are other ones you know so yeah. it's just nice to kind of like, kind of mix that. And um, like for me, I was, I started playing pieces from people that I knew, like in Rio that were friends or, you know, like that I thought was like m- music worth listening to and worth presenting. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah, I'm, I'm for sure going to go back to that. You yeah. probably understand the same thing I do in the sense that I came from Canada to here. So I kind of knew the Canadian American scene, scene, let's say. Uh, quite well and then I came here and there's just so many different the assumptions of what you should know and what you should do are different you know and they're valuable in both cases but the assumptions in Europe for example of what you should know about articulations about dynamics about phrasing that are not even assumed at all except for maybe some very very high level players in North America whereas there are some technical things and, and ways of doing things in North America that are kind of assumed to be normal and then you come here and it's totally the opposite even from country to country within europe so you probably understand the same thing i do where you show up in a new place and you're just like it feels a bit alien you know yeah yeah, um sure. yeah i don't know um yeah but that's part of the but point for of sure the, for sure that's part of the point of the stream though is that i'm trying also to help people get into different communities of guitarists you know and yeah well, i mean we're already a bubble but then you're right we have bubbles within the bubble so for sure. Yeah. And also, like, um, just the, the role models you have, right? I mean, you were playing stuff from, like, my professor and stuff. So it's like, in Germany, there was one bubble, and, and people I, I didn't even, like, had the chance to know of, you know? Like, uh, Thomas Müller in Brazil, like, I didn't know who he was. You know, like, this kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew, like, Hopstock, like, at most, that's what I knew. Yeah. So that's, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's, it's a little bubble. And also, like, the way they play and the way they think of things. Like, of course, in Brazil, we have Fabio Zanon, right? Who's very, very huge influence. Or Sergio Abreu, you mm-hmm. know? For, like, Brazilian yeah, guitarist, yeah. Sergio Abreu is, like, basically God, right? Yeah. And then you come to you come to Germany or you come to Europe and people don't know or people listen to him. is like, yeah, but the sound is a bit too bright, you know? Yeah, or it's a yeah, bit yeah. too articulated. Yeah. You know, it's a bit too articulated. It's a bit too, like, ta, ta, ta. And it's, like it's it's i mean it's not worth fighting it it's just interesting to see like the different way of thinking about it and the different way of playing yeah even the guitars they play like in brazil it's one kind of a guitarist and they have one goal and one uh, i mean there are advantages and disadvantages like i feel that in brazil people really because of the the way that they choose to do the guitars traditional guitars blah 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 they really like um, dig the sound a lot deeper than people do here in europe in general mm-hmm. but also even if you think of like the the modern French school, right? And um, 
the double top guitars and the small and blah, 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 and people are going to get used to playing a different way. I guess, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's not a matter of which, which one's better. It's just interesting to see the different things that people value, value, you know? And you try to take what you can from each tradition that works for you and makes sense to you musically, um, yeah. you know? Uh, Philip Conrad says, Pablo, what is your YouTube channel? I was looking for it. Sorry, maybe I didn't get it in the description. Um, I can type it here though. I might go to Facebook. I don't know if it'll go to YouTube. Um, do what's the, what's the channel called Pablo? Pablo Villa with two L's. Pablo Villa. I'll type it there. Okay. Um, and Tessa says, interesting. When I was studying, I was sometimes felt forced I sometimes felt forced to be a competition slash concert guitarist instead of just doing with it what you like to do. I think that's really valuable to recognize is that we, I think in every, every area of study that humans do, we sort of build up these archetypes of how it should be, how, what the path to success is. Right. And it's not, especially in music, I think it's not as straightforward as people think it is. Um, and something that I feel like I've noticed is that, if you look at the people who really have a long, long longevity in their career as a musician, maybe they aren't playing international concerts all the time. Maybe they aren't super famous all over the world in every bubble, like we were talking about. But they have a very like good career that has longevity, and they're respected in their communities, etc. Those people are not always the people, and I would say not often, not necessarily even often, the people who have the traditional what we think of as success as young players, which is to win a lot of competitions, have a big concert career from a young age and be kind of already famous as a young player, you know? Not that there's anything wrong with that again, but just that I don't think that even the people who have good concert careers are often are not in that archetype, you know? Um, they have other advantages, for example, they're great artists, but also they're great to get along with and great at networking and great at like making connections and being a good person to work with or other things like that. It could be many different factors, right? Um, or they don't even do the concert career thing. They do other things really well and they have longevity for that reason. So I just think like, we need to question the assumption that there's like one way to be successful as a guitarist, you know? There's just one thing I would add to that. I think like the biggest part of it is like recognizing that it's not uh, like uh, you're making a, an excuse for yourself that you say like, I don't want to be like that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, after a while, if you go like three, four, five, six years and you see that you don't practice like the same piece, or, you know, like you, you, you're not going so deep in one piece. It, you, you don't have a- You're not gonna play the Brower Sonata for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe the fourth, man, but any of the yeah. other ones, please. No. I, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like may, maybe like recognize from your actions that um, you, don't, you don't want it. Like you really don't want it, you know? Because yeah. I mean, honestly, I had the, like the support that I needed. If this was the way that I wanted to do things, I would have done it, you know? It's like, I didn't want to do it, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's really, um, and it, that's not a bad thing. I mean, I think there are many more creative ways that you can go about music than just trying to play the best piece of the of the moment, you know? It was Hinastera, and then I guess in America it was Barra Sonata, and then here yeah. was Jose, yeah. and then at some point is Rodrigo Toccata, you know, what if you don't like fucking Rodrigo Tocata? You know, yeah. it's like, maybe you don't want to do it. Well, and what if you want to say something else artistically and do a bunch of different things artistically that don't lend themselves to that? Like this tour I did in September with Nathan was like all new Canadian contemporary music. Many of the pieces were written for us or, or we knew people who they were written for. So it was like newly commissioned pieces. And it was actually most of it was not my exam repertoire. The only thing on my exam this June that was on that tour in September was the sonata that Nathan wrote me. But... You know, it took time out of my life and my practicing to prepare this tour and go do it with him. And if I was a player who was doing a competition every other month with a competition program, I probably would not have done that project, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm never going to do competitions again. I've done some in the past. I might do more. But, you know, the point is, like, to me, the value of learning that other program, putting that project together, getting the funding we needed, getting the concerts we had. And some of the, many of the concerts we had were not in guitar, like, societies or guitar organizations or guitar events some of them were but the point is that you know part of the project was reaching out so anyways i don't want to go on a rant about it but like you said i didn't I, I realized doing it like i didn't have the desire to sacrifice that artistic product for doing drilling my solo pieces more for some festival you know um so yeah it's it's a it's not that it's better to do something that isn't a competition it's just that like we can't all do that. And it's also not a model for success if everybody tries to do that. It's just, there's no, like, 
it doesn't it's i don't think it's um it's really a sustainable model for every player to aim for that you know no, at for all. sure not it's for a very small amount of people but i think the hard part is just admitting to yourself that you don't want to do it you know yeah. because i think it, the first thought that comes to mind is like it's not that i don't really want to do it. i'm just making it an excuse for myself because right. if i if i if i was really good you know i would i would be doing this yeah but I really good I would be preparing my Jose Sonata. Yeah, but preparing. the question yeah, I'm you know asking I mean? is like, does the world need another Jose Sonata played perfectly? You know, like I, uh, I, I struggle to think it does because even someone like me who loves guitar music and is obsessed with guitar enough to do it as my career, I don't want to hear another Jose Sonata. But you haven't heard mine, Michael. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> You know, so if, but what I'm saying is if even I am like, uh, eh, you know, I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. No, but it's, it's, it's not about that. It's not about like, you, you're considering like a artistic view in a way, right? Right. But like, I'm, I don't yeah. want to listen to that, but it's like, if people want to prove themselves that they, they can do it. Right. And, and to be I, fair. I think it's not bad. It's fine. And to be fair, I love the Jose Sanzana. And to be fair, maybe some audience that never heard guitar before would love that piece. So, but the point is, maybe you should prepare that piece to play for some real humans rather than another jury who's heard it like 40 times already that day, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. Stop shitting about the... Yeah, I know. I, I, I completely could, agree. Yeah, I, I completely I, agree. I know. I, this is so bad. I'm like doing this stream and just like always complaining about competitions and it's, it's you know. Yeah, anyhow. No, they're, they're actually a great thing because they bring guitars together. Many of my best friends I've met at festivals and competitions and many connections I have who, uh, with people like Nathan, who I did that project with, we met at a competition in Montreal. So, you know, through that, I met an amazing friend and he wrote me a piece and we have this collaboration. And so there's so many things that come out of it other than just the results. So anyways. Um, Are you going to do the, the other videos? Yes. Let's do another video. Um, do you want to do the solo one or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to do the solo one. I mean, the solo one was kind of like what we were talking about, that I wanted to do like smaller pieces some like pieces that people probably don't know yeah of, probably i mean in rio people know about the first piece okay so i there are three pieces together and the first one is a uh, oblique etude that was the project i wanted to get into that i kind of got stopped by going to the next round of this competition um but i'm gonna get back to it so these are six small pieces by a composer uh, named uh, fred schneider it's a german name but it's a brazilian guy from bahia and actually, his duo partner is a big uh, cultural organizer in, in Rio. He has a festival. And I mean, I was actually supposed to play there this year. I don't know what's going to happen now with this whole situation. Yeah. But um, like, so he has a lot of pieces. And these oblique etudes come from oblique because of like the way that the hand positions itself, basically. So, you know, like one, two, three, four in this sense and then in this sense. And it kind of changes. And then, of course, like some of the etudes are more like, sound i guess more like robotic or chromatic in a way mm -hmm. and some some of the etudes sound like very um impressionistic blah blah blah, just because they have the they have the this shape which is uh in the first strings is a major seventh chord right mm -hmm. so in the second etude for instance he uses that and but it's just i think is uh, i mean they're very short pieces and that's why i kind of wanted to do them because um I think people, if they're interested, they can just learn and, and play them because it's honestly worth playing them. It's like fun pieces. Um, but yeah, so this is the first one. It's the, the first oblique etude, uh, which I did, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And then the second piece, uh, I don't remember which order. There are three pieces. The second piece is also by a Brazilian guy called uh, Vicente Pascual, who's a guitarist. And he was also like my guitar teacher before coming to EU. So he helped me like do the preparing for the for the, for the audition. audition and yeah. everything yeah and um so i had classes with him and everything and he writes like a lot of songs and stuff and he has just nice melodies you know and he writes uh, he has like preludes and he has a pasacalia homage to frank martin and he has um fantasy and fugue i think uh, so he has some cool pieces you know cool. um he plays them I, there there's a recording of him on youtube you can go check it out uh, but I thought it would be cool to just, and of course, when you play it, like people around you know about it. So, I, and I really like this one, which is actually an homage dedicated. It's dedicated to the composer of the first piece. Oh, cool. So, <laughs> yeah. Nice. Relevant. Uh, yeah. There you go. Relevant points. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Your, your program has a theme. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> theme. Yes, there we go. <laughs> so the first one is the uh, Oblique Etude for Herr Schneider. Second one is the uh, dedication piece to Fred Schneider by Vicente Pascual. And the third one is a uh, waltz by Thierry Tisserand. I mean, I, there are many pieces by this guy and they just sound nice. And I honestly just had, like, I bought the piece and I had it in my shelf and I just want to play it. So nice. Basically. Wonderful. It. Okay, let's hear these three pieces. And I won't stop the video this time partway through.
Hi. We're back. I think we were missing the uh, the video ending. What do you mean? Oh, because it, it ended and we were sitting there typing to each other. Oh, just like. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Oops. Roman Grouchy is laughing at us, so that's good. We were discussing the show plans, guys. Um, yes. yes. Those are great pieces. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, awesome choices. And yeah, just relevant to each other. Um, so we're going to play a little game again. Oh, here you go. Well, not exactly a game, but I mean, sort of. It's a would you rather. Okay, I didn't, uh, yeah, all right. Would you rather. So I'm going to give you some unpleasant situations you have to choose between two options, I believe. Okay. Um, okay. Would you rather play with a chamber partner who doesn't listen very well and can't really follow? Or who doesn't lead very well? Can't give good cues, can't lead when they have the... The job to lead. Who, who doesn't listen for sure oh, okay. <laughs> yeah i'm fine i mean if if the person won't lead I'll, I'll do it but if the person won't listen i'm just gonna leave i mean honestly there's no point right oh philip told me my audio is sweet week again thank you philip oh my gosh i have to turn it down and up every time and i have to remember where it was <sighs> um okay so you'd rather have someone who doesn't listen for sure and uh, it's actually fun i mean from the three partners i have it's uh, a different dynamic. Every time is a different dynamic with, with every person, right? Mm -hmm. I guess with uh, guitarists, when you, you start playing with the with guitarists who are only used to playing solo, it's really hard because the tendency is they don't listen at all. Yeah. So they're playing second guitar as if it's first guitar. And right, it's very yeah, painful. yeah, it's worse. It's yeah. very painful, yeah. very painful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at some point people learn if they if they're committed to doing the chamber music thing. They will learn. learn, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, Sergio Hernandez just posted in the comments. He was on a few weeks back, and um, his girlfriend Lane Brackman, who's a great guitarist from um, Belgium, is doing a live stream. So he posted the link there, so you guys can go after this and watch her recite a live stream. It's really great. So I told Sergio cool. to come post it. So thanks for posting it, Sergio. Very cool. Very cool. Um, she's great. She's studying with Renee in Milwaukee, so it's going to be a good recital. Um, okay, so you'd rather have someone who doesn't listen. Uh, if you had one week to memorize and perform one of these two pieces, what would you choose? So this is going going back to <laughs> your problem with big pieces. But in this situation, you can just take one week to do it so you won't get bored. Um, would you rather in one week do the Walton Bagatelles or Invocazione Danza? Invocazione Danza. It's not so hard. Oh, really? <laughs> I ha I've never played it, but it's not so hard. <laughs> so it seems brutal. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe easier than you the Bagatelles. So? I mean, the bagatelles, it's so much more in terms of uh, articulation and texture. I mean, just the, the third bagatelle is very, very hard. I, I mean, of course, the, f the first and the last one for like physical reasons. Yeah. But you can always just fake it and play a bit slower. Mm -hmm. But the third one musically. Um, it's hard. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, Invocation and Danza, it's really not so much. I mean, there's a tremolo part which I don't know if it's also going to be a part of your would you rather things uh, <laughs> as far as I know, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, maybe the travel part might be a problem, but to be honest, it wouldn't, I, I would just play it very dirty. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're like loud and passionate, it's okay, you know? Yeah. There you go. Um, Nathan Bredesen says playing with bowed strings is a big adjustment for that. I think he's talking about listening. Yeah. I mean, the first time I played with bowed strings, well, I mean, I played with, no, actually, was it the first time I ever did? I think it may have been. I played with cello like once or twice, but just like very short, small pieces in concerts. And then I played the Tedesco Quintet <laughs> without any experience with like both strings, really. And it was like, it was fine because we had a week to rehearse. It was in a context where I had like three or four rehearsals with the quartet first. But yeah, after that first rehearsal, I was like, man, I have to rethink my attack completely because just like. You know, how, how did it work? How did it sound, the Tedesco Quintet? I, it was fine, but I had to use an amp, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, I would for sure use an amp. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I did. And sure. because it's, it's, it's it, Tedesco cannot, you cannot like pound out Tedesco except for when it's like, you know, some really intense parts of the Caprichos, maybe, or the last movement of the Sonata. But many of his pieces, 
uh, including that quintet, you have to be kind of delicate, I think. You know, you have to be a little bit yeah, Italian. No, for so. sure. But I think a lot of guitarists will go for the choice of just not being heard, you know? Yeah. Of like committing to the natural sound of the, the guitar and just sound not being guitar. heard. AKA yeah. un, un, inaudible. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But like that piece too, the guitar part's pretty fucking integral. Like you can't really, you know, so in the quintet, like you can't really get out, get away with not having it there. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. I agree. Okay. Anyways, um, would you rather play a concert when you haven't slept for an entire day, or would you rather eat a super hot chili pepper that you can't handle right before you go on stage? <laughs> Sounds new. <laughs> uh, for sure, the first one. For first sure. Place. Okay. I mean, I've done it, and uh, actually, I feel like when I'm really, really, really tired. I don't have the energy to be nervous mm. uh, like it happened to me a couple of years ago and it's kind of like your like your whole body is in survival mode <laughs> you're just like uh, i gotta do this yeah i played it it was november two years ago and it was actually like i was having a friend of brazil in uh, of like a good friend from brazil over with his girlfriend and it was my birthday and i had two concerts i was playing uh Toroba sonatina and some other small pieces and I, I remember doing that for sure, just like playing completely wasted, just drinking from the night before. And it sounded fine. I mean, of course you have to manage. You mm -hmm. just don't go with it like full power or whatever, but- Yeah, maybe don't do it two it days in a row. Yeah, I did that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Two days in a row. But yes. <laughs> wow, the truth comes out. Oh man. Um, <laughs> Tony Boy Fire says good vibes, indeed. <laughs> nice. Um, good vibes. Okay. Uh, would you rather have shaky hands or shitty nails when you play? Shitty nails. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, shaky hands is complete shit. I mean, I had not so many times, but it's just, I don't know. It's just so bad to think that like you want to express where you want musically and you're not able to. Shitty nails. I mean, I feel like I've done it many times. Actually, during my whole master's, I had uh, gel nails, mm. which don't sound that great. I mean, even if you file them a lot, like for the thumbnail is fine, but for the other nails, it doesn't sound that great. There's always a little like on it, you know? Yeah, little... yeah. I have all fake nails, but but I have these like um, nails from that guitar nails kit. There's like a guy in Italy who like, okay. and they actually feel and sound pretty much the same as real nails. Okay. Um, yeah, but the, the gel ones are really thick, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had them once, and it, it didn't. It was too clicky. No, for sure. Um, would you rather go on stage and play an entire concert in your pajamas, or would you rather play an entire concert really, really sick, like you're coughing and sneezing and stuff, and like your nose is running, and you know. <laughs> but like the pajama concert would be like the best you ever played. Like you would go in on your pajamas and was like, what the fuck? But then you play like perfectly and it's like really be inspired. And... Mm -hmm. I, I, I did the second one not so long ago, actually. Okay. Yeah, it was um, it was a guitar. Um, actually, it was was funny. It was a guitar in a, in a kind of like a window thing. It was a guitar maker. He had a Marius here from Hamburg. Okay. And he organized a concert with his um, wife, who's a theater director, and they got a lot of people there. And I had to play from like a window up high in the second second floor. It was like an open window. I would sit there and play. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very, very sick. Like very mm -hmm. sick. Of course, all the pieces were like, at mo the hardest piece was Capricio Arabi, I think. All the other ones were like Tariga and I don't know, maybe like some Villa Lobos Prelude or something. There were no like, I think there was like uh, Jose Pavana, but not like any of the other okay, movements, yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, but I would for sure play in my pajamas. But like, you know, the, the second one, I, I have no idea how it felt. Like I had to play. I had to like lay down for like two hours before playing. And then I didn't want to cancel it because it kind of felt, felt shitty, but I was getting really, really, really sick. And then I played and I couldn't talk to anybody when I left, you know, because it was, I really couldn't, you know, and then I just stayed home like a week. Really yeah, sick. yeah. Um, I really don't want to do that again. I mean, next time if I feel really sick, I'm just going to go home because it's, it's a very shitty situation. I felt like I had to do it. Like it was my duty to do this right. performance thing, but um, yeah, I just, it would be better not to do it. Yeah. Uh, Philip Conrad is asking, what is your favorite nail kit? Fuck, um, 
I don't have a nail cut. Actually, yeah. you you might have. I just use these things from Guitar Nails. Uh, what is it? Guitar. I think it's called Guitar Nail Kit. Actually, it's like this Italian supplier, and um, it comes with the dots, the, the like glue stuff, like tab things that you use. But I use like a I use like a normal like drugstore fake nail, like the kind of um, uh, beauty nail for the thumb. Finger, fingers, fingers. Is it uh, I use the ones from Kiss. But yeah. I use this thumbnail because I actually glue it on. I don't use like the dot things that come for the other ones because the thumb you I play so hard with the thumb that I need you know. How long does it last? The thumbnail lasts four or five days. The other nails is maybe two days because they're they're like you can pull them off. You know, yeah. it's pretty strong. Yeah, but that's that, that that's the difference with the gel nails, though. I mean, I I completely agree the sound is shit, but they last for like two months, man. Yeah, honestly. that that's that would have been nice, but. These the nice thing about these is that I have perfect control over the length at all times, because if something gets too short, I can just pull it off and re-glue it at a different spot. Exactly, you know, like okay. exactly the okay. so when I perform, oh, nice. I and I have like a whole supply of them, so I can always shape a new one. So when I perform, I always have the exact length I want, the exact shape I want, unless yeah. unless I don't have time if I'm like running to the gig. But that would be true if I had real nails. You wouldn't have time to like make them as nice as you want. But in this case, yeah, you know the the consistency is so nice. Because I never have to worry about length and and um, shape. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. Like that that's that was the reason why I had gel nails for for the the whole time that I was doing my masters. You know, because you don't want to be like wanting to play a hard piece. Yeah. And you can't control like your nails are too short. You know, you practice too much scales and then yeah, gone. Yeah. But now I just have uh, natural nails because I don't practice so hard. Like I'm not practicing any scales. And actually, this this week I just started playing scales with PI. Mm -hmm. on the bass strings and it just makes life much easier i have no problem with that right yeah yeah that's like chill. the renaissance method you know and i played um yeah i played damilano uh richard Carus, and uh my professor at the time daniel bolshoi made me play like all the scales even on like the first and second string with pi because he's like it's you know it's uh, authentic and actually it sounded cool and it worked and i was like oh i see why they did this <laughs> you know yeah yeah. It works. It works for the other stuff also. I'm not yeah. even sure. Like I haven't practiced. Like, but I'm playing Tahaga now, and I would play with Bi for sure. It works yeah. because especially if you can rest the like the Ma on the other strings, like makes life very like a lot easier. Yeah, of course it becomes a problem when you add lower notes or whatever. So you know. Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking about playing scales. Right. Like, I mean, before or after though. Sometimes depending on the proximity of other chords and things, it can be like tricky. It depends, though. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, I don't see it so much that way. Like, mm -hmm. if, I, if I have the eye on the last note before the scale and I have time to prepare the other fingers for the chord, it's really, like, I don't know, it works. Right, yeah. Unless all the notes are below. Uh, anyhow. Um, okay, let's not, yeah, let's not get into the weeds here. Let's just keep going. Okay, um, cool. Well, why don't we listen to some more chamber music now you have some britain right yes i think um okay so these are two movements from britain yeah um from the songs from the chinese um if you don't know this recording by julian bream and peter pears pears who was, was britain's lover yes exactly yes. husband or lover husband, husband okay Hus well okay yes i'm hearing husband here Hus from, the from the singer the singer knows the singer knows It was not official husband. Not official. Because we, as a society, were not there yet. Yeah, but you know, hopefully your husband is also your lover. I'm just saying, you know. Not for long, let's be honest. Not for not long. long. <laughs> Do you think like Britain and Peter were at the point where they were like, uh, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> She's okay. right there, so man. These are, two... <laughs> these are two movements from Britain. Uh, Okay, so songs from the Chinese, there are six movements in total. Yeah. And they're really, really, really cool in the way that Britain uses the guitar. Many different effects. Uh, actually, on the second movement, you can he only uses like Miss Sunday. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Chinese in instrument, it's really cool. And the third movement is all about the slurs. Yes. And uh, this recording is from Anna's uh, final concert. She was doing her, not her masses, but her uh, concert exam, which Diploma, is like a... Yeah. Yeah, diploma that comes after the masters, right? Yeah. Um, so it was in a co-hall, cool and we played. Okay, so I think I put two Britain 
and I put a Giuliani at the end just so that people don't get like the the Britain vibe at the end because actually the first movement is called Autumn Wind and it's kind of like flying and whatever it's fun but the second one is called Depression and it's really like sad yeah <laughs> naturally it's like a low vibe so I put some Giuliani because just to make <laughs> you have to end it slider. but you know the unicorn one is actually pretty good the last one it's, it's a good ending good. yeah it's pretty good it's I it... think there was probably there was uh, to be honest some like mistake or something no that's why I didn't put it I'm not oh, okay. sure I have to check yeah I have to check I, have I love that on one though one. Yeah, it's really cool. Alas, really cool. for the unicorn. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I should have put that one. I'm sorry. Yeah. If I knew you liked it, I would have put it. I, sure. It's my favorite. Okay. Yeah, Jessica sang Thank these. Actually, know. it's funny. Me and Jessica never did these together, but I, my duo partner in my masters in Canada, um, Joel Thompson, who's actually Joel's going to come on later this month. So shout out for that. But he, he and I used to play in a duo, a bunch, and. Um, then he he wanted to do these and he had another singer he did them with at ubc because she was studying there jessica wasn't studying there but then we went and did like this little tour in in british columbia of concerts the three of us so he did them with jessica then so she got to sing with two different guitarists in one concert which was kind of fun um but i'm a little jealous that we never played these because they were actually really fun to listen to so we should really do them now i don't know they're cool um okay so britain and giuliani and which giuliani is this this is uh, the fifth. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is from the Cavatina Opus Thirty Nine. Nice. Which are like, to be honest, like Giuliani has a lot of songs, and the yes. songs are really fun, yeah. really cool. Yeah, they are. Uh, for this cycle, the songs like the accompany, the accompaniment is very simple. Uh, I've heard that for the Zex Lieder, the six songs that he put, I think Opus 69 or something, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a bit more complex, but the accompaniment is really simple, but the, the, the song is fun. So. Cool. Okay. Um, do you know this Giuliani song that has the text about the cockroaches? No. It has text no, about no. the cockroaches, the cucarachas. It's really great. It's you should okay. I'll I'll send you a score after the stream. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. You say like cucarachas. Yeah. We're not. We're not. We don't speak Spanish. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Anyhow. That's fine. Yes, That's of fine. course. Okay. No, I mean it's just it's it yeah it's it's a fun song. Okay, let's listen to this in Britain. We'll do it. Yeah. All right. <laughs>
I'm pretty Is sure. It over? I think pretty sure it's over. You guys bowed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. No, it's just I was I was following you from uh, Anna's phone, so of course there's a delay. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. There's a delay. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. I didn't cut it short this time. Thank you so much. I got it right. <laughs> oh man. Uh, and you know what? Ingrid is with me. She says, "What? No unicorn." <laughs> Yeah, I know. Actually, we played for Ingrid right before her this recital, and she really liked the unicorn piece. The unicorn is the best one. All those like slides, it's fun. Um, anyhow, I'll stop. I'll stop harping on about the unicorn. Uh, so I also like to always ask. Um, oh, actually, before we move on, just so everyone knows, um, you can check out all of Pablo's links to all his like um, his Instagram. I think I have your website or no, your Facebook and I, yeah, your YouTube channel. You can just search your name on YouTube. I'm sure it'll come up, Pablo Villafuerte. But check out mm -hmm. his Instagram and his other links because uh, you're posting a lot of playing. So in this quarantine time, it's a good time for people to listen to you since, yes, you know, yes. you're putting out a lot of things. And um, you can also see in the description the links to uh, support the stream if you so feel like doing or have the ability to do so um but you can also just like support the stream by listening so i have all the archived episodes on my youtube channel as well um maybe i should be putting a link for that anyhow if you search my name on youtube michael libson you'll find my channel and you can find the the archive of all the conversations but um i also try to like to ask the guests to share some secrets of how they practice or how they could be technique or could be musical things what do you what you know what is something that has helped your practice a lot what can you share with the audience yeah, I mean, there's, um, of course, a lot to talk about, but I'm just going to mention the, like, the latest things that have been changing my playing, right? Um, actually, the, I, I remember all the topics I sent you, but one of them was left-hand position. So basically, there's this little line in uh, Scott Stennon's Pump in Nylon, which is about left-hand position, and he mentions the position of the fourth finger. I know this is very nerdy, right? But... Um, I felt really like when I read it and I saw the picture, I was like, man, why didn't I listen to this like fucking 10 years ago? And um, there are some players who do this very nicely. 
basically what he says is you should position your finger um, like the most balanced position, let's say it, right? It doesn't mean they have to do it all the time. That's not the point. But um, that it's very balanced to do it like that, right? Like you should maybe practice when you do your slurs, when you do your scales in the morning, blah, blah, blah. Go for that. And if you can do it while you're doing some music, go for it. Is to like position it a bit further to this corner. Are you aware of this? Yes. Did you know this? Yeah. Am I like the only one who didn't know this shit? The, um, <laughs> well, the like... Um... How do you say the oh my camera the yeah it, it, it ends up being pointed the other direction than the other fingers a little yeah, bit right yeah 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 honestly to me i felt like I'm, I'm not sure if this is true or not i just felt like that like i never paid attention to it you know so yeah. of course um, i found you know what i mean yeah i found with teaching beginners and amateurs and younger players with my students i have found that doing this work on the the third and fourth finger and the head position and balance and square position even though, like you said, the point is not that you do it all the time, because I always tell them, like, look, if I play a C major chord, I am not doing that position. I'm doing this position, right? Like, that's normal. So, um, the, 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 that position is not used 100% of the time. It's not even used the majority of the time necessarily. But the point is that all the difficult passages, you have to have the ability to do that position perfectly, basically, and to balance the hand okay. in that way, especially when the third and fourth finger have to be independent of each other. And you have yeah. to do some kind of thing that involves all four fingers. So it's just, yeah, it's not forcing people to use that position all the time, because of course, that would be idiotic. It's just that many people struggle with that position. And so when those passages yeah, come up, they... I agree, kind of. But like, if you, if you look into uh, Zoran Dukic, right? You know his left hand? Yeah. Have, have you checked it out? Like, uh, like, have you paid attention to just his left hand? No. How he does it? Like, it's there are. I think I feel like there's a lot of positions that people would not do it, and he does it. Mm. Like you can see his little pinky, like completely, like just scrambled and going like full on this way and stuff. And I mean, of course, I know this is very basic, I guess, right? But um, just how seriously he takes it, I found it really inspiring. A bit like the way yeah. he uses it. And then, of course, from there, so you know, uh, I'm not going to do some like technical exercises. I mean, I, I told you maybe we could do some glissandi and stuff, but I think it's kind of late. And my bottle of wine is completely empty. empty. So, uh, so no glissandi. Uh, I, <laughs> no, but I was, I mean, I can do it if you want. But like the exercises that I've been doing, like more recently, of course, they're the slurs in the morning for sure. Uh, the right hand preparation is something that's really like something I uh, think helps me a lot. I really start with like every each hand prepared playing in the morning, yeah. like this I and then chromatic, just M chromatic, A chromatic, just getting the sound right, getting the direction of the fingers right. I mean, the, um, I mean, it's not, there's not much new to that, but I think it's important that you do it kind of every day. Um, but then the glissandi is something like, of course now I'm playing Tahiga and stuff, right? But I think they're not just for Tahiga, for like, I'm playing a Brazilian toccata also. And I feel like a lot of times it's like useful to just use the glissando instead of a slur if it's like a one, like a half tone thing. And it's uh, it's really cool because the slur, of course, if you do like a three, four slur, you're like pulling, uh, you're going in this direction, right? And then you kind of have to change position. So there's kind of like a compound movement of doing this, right? And if you can afford to, in some pieces, I think this goes for like, Jose Sonata, fourth movement. I think this goes for uh, Brower Sonata. I think there are a lot of places that you can just keep your, your hand position fully and then just like slide one. And to be honest, people are not gonna notice if you did a full on slur or if you just change position. And um, I don't know, that's something that I've been practicing. So I do like, first I start with the right hand, just finger per finger preparation and getting the dynamics right and practicing dynamics in my technical practice because I think that's something people don't do yep. and then when you do crescendo they get like this tension in the shoulder or they do you know what I mean like they do a decrescendo well, and the they other, the mouth or whatever. the bigger problem too well it's also in the in, in technique but the bigger problem is that when people do slow practice on their pieces like slow metronome practice where they're paying attention to like efficiency of movements and like you know, uh, making sure that everything's like staying close to the string and that everything's like perfectly on time. They're also not doing dynamics during this kind of practice. So their muscle memory that develops is without dynamics. And then when they're like later, they're like, oh, just add them. Then they get all this extra tension like you're talking about. Um, yep. So, yeah. Well, you know what? There's something I heard from the Lukas uh, Koropashevsky seminar mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, 
Like I'm a big fan of his playing yeah. overall. Of and course. I think a lot of people are, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's something he said, like, just like he mentioned, he didn't make a point of like pressing down on it, but he said like tension is not really important in technique. Like you should have no tension technique, but in music, it is something that you can use like yeah. different words. Yeah. Right. But, um, but that's kind of like, now I accept it a bit more. Now that's something that is allowed to do when I'm playing a piece, because I do notice like when I practice, uh, like technically a piece, I really have a mirror in front of me and I just try to like stare really creepily at my own eyes <laughs> so that I'm sure that I'm not tensioning like mouth or shoulder or, yeah. you know, like inside, I don't know, I just have tension wherever and the position's right. But what, then when I play, I do notice that all of these things happen. And I'm, I think it's, I don't know, I don't know how you deal with that, but like it was, for me, it was nice to hear him say it, you know, because of course, if you look at a player like, I don't know, John Williams or something, right? He's just like, yeah, but some of us, that's why some of us don't really enjoy his playing very much. Okay. You know, I'm not saying that it's bad playing, but just for me, I'm like, I need a little more tension out of a player almost, you know, in some ways. I don't know. It, yeah. For me, like, I, I, I would much rather watch a player who seems to tense up a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it, but, it, but it is a paradox, right? Because we work technically in, like, dissociating um body tension from music tension yeah and then yeah. in playing that kind of has to like switch in a way you know what i mean yeah no i know what you mean it's it's, te it's definitely a paradox but what i'm saying is that like yeah you can't you can't be entirely devoid of it um that being said it's not fun to watch a player who looks tense and looks stressed so you know it's yeah it's a it's the difference between actually being tense and stressed all the time and like having that affect your playing and i guess using that in the right moment as a musical effect so yeah, but you don't plan that right you don't practice the tension where you need it no like, of course not that's, yeah it that's just what happens. i mean yeah that's what i mean i mean there are some players i can think of some of course we're not going to mention but that you feel like a lot of tension in the mouth in the face in the shoulders blah blah, yeah. blah and they play great yeah but it's just yeah. so um i'm not going to say annoying but you know what i mean like it's it's very distracting yeah this whole tension thing and we kind of strive for being in a way john williamsy but not losing any of any of the any of the musical expression yeah. from it you know yeah um but at the same time we don't practice like okay this scale i want this crescendo and i'm gonna do this um sound at the end and i'm allowed to do this tension <laughs> you know what i mean weird, like we don't practice this that. weird face here yeah 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 we don't practice that shit. it just happens right yeah, I don't of know. course, yeah. It's getting very nerdy, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Well, part of it is just not not holding yourself back from expressing yourself in the moment in, in the sense of, like, not trying to remove tension to the point of, like, in the performance, just, like, calming yourself down every time you get excited, you know? Like, you, you still have to get excited when you're playing a little bit to some extent. So. Okay. Yeah. Anyhow. Okay, cool. Uh, we're going to play the lightning round really quick and then we'll listen to our last performance. Nice. So you know how the lightning round works, right? This or that, basically. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, also Roman, uh, Roman Brodsky says many string players rely on body movement to sway with the music. It's true. Yeah. I mean like, but movement is also different than tension in a way. I mean, these are all words that you can define differently, but Yeah. I mean, the movement the movement debate is something we maybe shouldn't get into. <laughs> uh, I remember one master class with William Beauvais in Canada. He was saying to some other player, like, you have to play with only one butt cheek on the chair, on the chair you know? Because <laughs> this player was, like, so still and dead that it just, like, you know. Um, anyways. Yeah, okay. We're not going to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's do our lightning round, Pablo. You ready? Yes. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Bogdanovich or Brower? Bogdanovich. Oh, okay. Uh, East, no, by, far, uh, by far. By, by far. far I mean, by far. Scarlatti or Bach? Bach. Uh, vanilla or chocolate? Vanilla. Solo or chamber? Chamber. Mammals or reptiles? It has to be lightning, right? Reptiles. Yeah. Um, 
Beer or wine? Wine. Claudio Abado or Herbert von Kerian? Abado. Pizza or pasta? Pasta. Uh, Liszt or Chopin? Liszt. Uh, apoyando or tirando? Free stroke, rest stroke? <laughs> this is such a shitty question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point, is to make you have to choose between two things you like. Because it's like there's no context, right? You don't know, like, yeah. where, okay, <laughs> tirando, tirando. Tirando, tirando. Okay, uh, breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Okay, uh, contemporary or classical slash romantic? Guitar repertoire. Yeah. Um. <laughs> You're like. <laughs> it's like you don't want to choose. Yeah. No, that's that's really hard to go lightning. Um, if I had to go lightning, I would say um, classic romantic. Okay. Uh, South Park or The Simpsons? South Park. Nice. Campanella or regular scales? Campanella. Campanella, me too. Uh, Sor yeah. or Giuliani? Giuliani. Ah, me too. We we have so much in common, Pablo. Really, Giuliani? Yeah. I think you're like the first person I've heard. That oh, really? Would agree with this answer? No, I honestly. Yeah. I I don't know why. I just I can't listen to Sor. I can't. I mean, obviously, I can't play Sor because it's too hard. But <laughs> I hard, I find it hard to listen to also. So you know, there's that. Oh, but Giuliani is just so nice. It's just so nice. Yeah, it is. Honestly. It it really is. And, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, Leo, for instance, right? He, he doesn't understand that for sure. Yeah, well. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's he true. makes fun of me by because I really love Giuliani. I mean, I love Giuliani in any any capacity that he goes, like the flute, sonatina, anything, whatever. It doesn't matter, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Any other pieces. It's just um, it's just so nice to have like a repertoire that um, you have to bring something to the table. You know, yeah. it's like it's not. It's not about the piece that you play or whatever. It's not really flashy, the, harmon the harmonies, whatever. It's about the proportion and it's all there. And it, it really shows who you are as a player, I think, if you play something like that, right? True, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Tremolo or scales? Scales. Tremolo is not a big thing for you, is it? No, <laughs> it's really not. <laughs> I don't think, honestly, I don't think I ever played a piece where there was an actual tremolo. I only played... Um, you obey saw variations, which is half ass tremolo. Yeah. You know, it's a P I M A M I. So it's not an actual tremolo. Yeah. And um, like most of the tremolo pieces, uh, I don't know, like even Swing on La Floresta, right? People yeah. really love playing that in competitions in Germany. Yeah. And I find it very annoying. I mean, if I have a chance to not listen to it, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Wow, shots fired. Honestly. I thought I was complaining about competition repertoire earlier a lot, but this is, you know, this is pretty hard. No, but it's it's not even just like competition. It's just like it's a taste and it's it's I get it that it, it, it can be hard to play. I'm not even going to shit on it because I, I'm not doing it right. So yeah. I, I have no right on, of shitting on it, but it's just annoying to listen to because guitars think is like this really awesome thing to play a tremolo. Yeah. And I just find it like, yeah, in the end, you're still playing, you're still playing like A minor with the E pedal on the top. You know what I mean? And, and then. But it's hard to do consistently, you know? It something else. Yeah. What? It's hard to do consistently in any ways, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's hard. But that's what I mean. Like, it's, it's hard technically, I guess. Yeah. But the musical part of it, there's no magic. I mean, I think. The, there's no magic? Oh, my gosh, Pablo. I don't think we that's can. That's what I mean. Our, yeah, I our, our friendship is over now. <laughs> Yeah, I lost all of I my play, I play, American I, friends. I always have a tremolo piece in my program. And I, yeah, I love playing tremolo. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry to me, there's not. I mean, I, I, I listened to a couple of times David Russell tremolo, right? Which is supposed to be amazing. It's no, just, supposed uh, to be. Okay, we're just going to move on now. We're just going to move <laughs> on to the next. David Russell tremolo is supposed to be amazing. Okay. Um... <laughs> You shouldn't That's have drank. I, mean. I have no love for the technical difficulty. I don't care. It's still just no, no. But it, with David Russell's tremolo, it's not about the te okay, whatever technical. Okay, it's not. It's not that great, is it? No, it's not about the technical thing. Is what I'm saying. It is great technically, but it's not with his tremolo, especially. It's not about the technical aspect. It's about the amazing tone and the amazing consistency and the musical phrasing. Like yeah, but his his amazing tone is there everywhere, you know. Oh yeah, for sure. But but in tremolo, it's especially like you know. Anyways, we're just gonna move on. Especially night. Let's move on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Horowitz or Rubinstein? Who? Horowitz or Harvard. Rubinstein? 
Horowitz. Horowitz. Okay. Uh, Rodrigo. No, to be honest, those are not my two like biggest piano. References. Who are your two biggest piano references? Two. Or one. Um, Maria Joan Pires. Okay. Would be the. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, but I think if I ask that name, not everyone would know that. No, no, I, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying. I'm yeah, just yeah. putting my. <laughs> are you telling me I how mean, to run my show? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Rodrigo or Tedesco? Who? Rodrigo or Rodrigo Tedesco? Tedesco? Yeah. Rodrigo. Rodrigo, nice. Uh, Tibu Garcia or Andre Devitis? Devitis. Devitis, okay. Um, concert or masterclass when you're the one giving it? I honestly don't know. I mean, I. I would lean more towards concert, but I really enjoy like nerding out on, on masterclass shit and talking about technical musical stuff. I think there's a lot of room of creativity in that. Yeah, concert. I think we can tell you like nerding out here. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> restoration of the composer's intention or personal interpretation? Personal interpretation. Okay. Uh, Bream or Segovia? Segovia. Oh, interesting. Mountains or beaches? What? Mountains or beaches? Beaches. Oh, okay. Um, Marchandila or Zoran Dukic? Dukic. Dukic. Dukic cool. now. I'm, I'm honestly really disappointed sometimes with uh, Marchandila. Really? Oh, I mean, I love I love Martin's playing. I always have. I, I was a complete fanboy, like when I came to, to Europe. Complete, yeah. complete. But at some point, I just feel like he's a bit too... Um, it's it's funny because it's gonna contradict my last answer of before that one, of going with the personal interpretation, but I feel a bit like his uh, phrasing is uh, sometimes ketchup, yeah, and that he uses it very often. Right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean that's a small quibble, but yeah, those are that's the thing with with guitarists, what the players we like, we choose them on very small things, you know. Yeah. Because we know so many. Um. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna listen to the last recording before we sign off. Um, Very nice. And this what is, it? is Piazzolla with Ingrid. Ingrid, oh, if she's okay. still watching, she has um, she has lasted through a long stream to wait her wait to hear uh, this performance. Okay, so this is a this is a this is a like a exclusive thing, right? Because it's it's not an open video. Oh. No, no. This Piazzolla is actually a closed video. This is from my uh, graduation recital. Yeah. And it, it was a time that I was going completely crazy with like trying to learn. A, like in three months, I decided to learn uh, the Lobos Concerto. And I was playing Jose Sonata, Piazzolla, and then Assad with Leo. And uh, a transcription I had of uh, French Suite Number no. 5 for eight string guitar. And it, can, it was like a lot of program. And crazy. I hadn't played with Ingrid for two years. So, and she, because she was living there, right? And I just said, like, I really wanted to come to play for my absolutes. And we had like three rehearsals before that. So I think wow. this recording is like, I love it because it's all about the chamber music aspect of it. It's like all about the reaction and stuff. And uh, like, of course we didn't have a lot of rehearsals. So like all, all of all of the possible shit that could happen, happened. Yeah, like yeah. my finger fell on the guitar. I didn't wait for her for the next piece. Like we played the four, uh, all four movements. But I just showed the last two because they're my favorites. And also, I think she really enjoyed playing the fourth one. The fourth one's the most like fun. People don't play it, right? People play the cafe and nightclub. Yeah. But the fourth movement's just so fun to play. And uh, the like the Batok Pitikato I do it was actually her suggestion in the rehearsals, right? Oh, cool. Uh, it's just it's all fun to see the reactions, you know, because it's like things that we had no time to prepare, mm -hmm. and then you see like things happening on stage and we have to react to it yeah um of course it was not like I, that's why I, I think it's not on like open on youtube because it's not our technical uh, best yeah but it's just a lot of fun so yeah, yeah well here people have to sit through like two and a half two hours and 15 minutes of stream before they get to it so it's fine oh there you go it's all good <laughs> yeah um yeah that's awesome i mean that sometimes those are the best experiences with chamber music where you you're, you know, you're not necessarily at your best prepared, but you go in and you make something special and unique happen in that moment. It sounds stupid yeah. or silly to say, but some of the best memories I have of performing are definitely from those situations. Yeah, that's how I feel about this performance also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Okay, and this is, this is one or two movements, just so I don't stop it early. These are the last two movements. Last two, okay, I won't, <laughs> I won't stop the video early. Okay, Piazzolla time. Mm.
Very nice. Hey. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> we saw you yeah. dancing along to the last few measures. Uh, that's nice. It's enjoyable. That was cute. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Great. Well, that sounded great. And uh, congrats to Ingrid also. Super good playing. Cool. Well, Pablo, it's been so much fun having you on. This has been awesome. Thanks, man. It's been really fun. Really, really fun. Just have, have some wine with a friend to talk about chamber music, guitar, everything. It's great. Um, nice. I hope that we meet again soon. I'm going to be staying in the Netherlands after I graduate, so that's nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, for sure. We're going to see each other then. Yeah, definitely. In Groningen or some other place? I live in no, Utrecht. No, no. Uh, Maastricht, right? I live in Utrecht, actually. Okay. And I, um, I'm going to stay in, in Utrecht um, Yeah, when I graduate. I got my residence permit recently, so it's nice. Nice. Yes. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And thanks, everyone, for listening. It's been great that there's been people commenting, asking questions, talking. It's good. Um, Ingrid, says, Ingrid says, I preferred that haircut of yours for our duo. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Check out the archive on YouTube of all the episodes. Check out Pablo's uh, links, website, um, or YouTube and all these things. And um, next week, I have on Tuesday, the 12th, I have Jacob Sayer, who's in Vancouver. And he did his master's at the same time as me with Daniel Bolshoi in Vancouver. But he went kind of in a more sort of fingerstyle direction after he graduated. So he writes a lot of his own music, plays mostly steel string now. But he takes a lot of, uh, I would say, inspiration from composers like Bogdanovich, actually. He, uh, I remember in the master's, he was playing the polyrhythmic etudes a bunch and stuff. So his music is kind of this kind of like sort of progressive finger style slash classical music played on steel string guitar, which is really cool. So something a bit different for the stream. And then on Friday, the what Friday the 18th or 17th? What is it? Let me check. Um, Friday the 15th, sorry, I have Rene Izquierdo coming on. So one of the sort of hard hitters of classical guitar in North America, but uh, from Cuba. And yeah, I'm, we all know Rene. He's, he's amazing. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun having him on. Uh, so next week is Jacob and Renee. So tune in at 8 p.m. CET for those. Or check out the archive when they're done. I usually get them up like a day or two after. Um, and this episode will be on my channel in a bit too. So, And yeah, Pablo, is there anything you want to say to people before we finish? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I heard, I saw in the comments that my cousin told me to say hi. It's actually in Portuguese we say mandar um salve. Nice. Other than that, no, I'm awesome. completely fine. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so much for listening, and thank you, Pablo, for coming on.